ອົງກຸຍຈໍບາອົງຈຳແນກປະກາດບັນຕໍກະຈໍາລາການນິຕິວິທີສາມນາການໃຫ້ນັງປະກົນວິທິການຈູນເຕີນໍານາງພະພິ
uh, deserted by the Vietnamese and that the Vietnamese withdrawal uh, from Cambodia. They never referred to the uh, Paris peace talks. They said that this is a betrayal of the Cambodian Revolution. This was an intentional move of the Vietnamese to, um, to undermine what was going on in Cambodia. They, uh, and the returnees, uh, people who had gone up to uh, North Vietnam in 1954-55 as part of the peace settlement to the First Indochina China War, I think numbers are contradictory, but it seems like seven or eight hundred of them at least came south to join the Cambodian Revolution in 1970, and some of them managed to get out before the purges started, but others were, were purged at this time. So we're starting to get a, an, an open tilt against uh, Vietnam in, in party policy, which would certainly not have been possible when there were three uh, Vietnamese divisions inside the country. And just following up on, on that answer, um, you estimate that some 700 or 800 um, uh, CPK cadre had returned from Vietnam and in your conclusion many were purged. Um, as if we can just look forward beyond 72, um, did any of those uh, cadre, uh, were any of those cadre appointed to positions of authority? In, in other words, were there any people in positions of authority uh, later in the 1970s who had uh, spent this time in Hanoi and were trained there? Yes, but only after 1979. And a, a small uh, correction, just to your wording. I want to make sure that the, the, the returnees coming down from Vietnam were not CPK cadre. They may not even have been members of the CPK. They had sympathized with the movement in the 1950s. Might well, we don't know, might well have been brought into the Vietnamese party while they were living in Vietnam for those 15 years, but they were not cadre of the CPK. These, they were sympathizers, or they thought they were sympathizers of the Cambodian Revolution. Thank you, and thank you for correcting my uh, characterization of uh, these uh, groups. And if we could explore that relationship with Vietnam just a little bit further. You say um, uh, we're still on tragedy of Cambodian uh, history, uh, which unfortunately is only available in, in, in English. Um, ERN 001932, that will be page 219, um, if that makes it easier, Professor. There's a brief passage here where you state, quote, in public, who you uh, was no, more discreet, and it was only in 1973 when nearly all the Vietnamese troops were gone that CPK cadre began calling them the number one enemy. In 1988, Serene recalled that Tamo had urged Lachine to, quote, destroy friend number seven secretly where possible, end quote. And and even Nong Suon, in spite of perhaps, or perhaps because of his ICP experience, was anti-Vietnamese in private. Um, could you describe for us um, this development as it, as it uh, seems to occur in 1973, where there is a, uh, you, you, you seem to suggest an opening, uh, a more opening up of, of that uh, resentment, uh, or perhaps more public statement of it. Um, could you explain uh, uh, for us what, what significance, if any, that meant that had for, uh, for the development of CPK's policies? Uh, in 1973, I think what the significance of this page actually is that it uh, reflects the findings of two uh, young uh, Cambodian school teachers who 
uh, went out of Phnom Penh and to the revolutionary base uh, and joined uh, in 73, which was closer to, was not in Ratnik Korea at that time, and joined the uh, Khmer Rouge movement and uh, came away with lots of specific information of what they had been told and said. Uh, the uh, book was um, banned in Cambodia at the time but it, uh, when it was published, but it seems to me to have represented an authentic effort by these two people to say what they had encountered in the Khmer Rouge uh, region, the statements that are made that they report on from Tamok and so on, uh, in no way contradict other uh, documents that have come to the for a secret. So I think it's significant this is a kind of an opening up uh, of uh, evidence that uh, widens our perspective on this particular period. And I was able to interview um, Sarin himself in, uh, in California in 1988. Thank you. Um, now, Moving on to um, another policy which you actually referred to yesterday um, in, in, uh, in relation to the pre-75 period, where now in 1973, um, you made reference to uh, policies of introducing cooperatives. Um, this is dealt with um, Again, uh, in both the tragedy of Cambodian history and, and in Brother No. 1, um, I might uh, read the quote from Brother No. 1 and see if because that is available in Khmer and see if we can have it on the screen. Uh, the English ERN for Brother No. 1 is 00393010. The Khmer ERN is 00821762. We'll try and have that Khmer uh, passage also on the screen uh, for the benefit of Khmer speakers. Um, the, pass the passage is as follows. In early 1973, Cambodian communist troops attacked government troops throughout the country to expand territorial control and to set their social programs in motion. The process was closely monitored in the southwest. Measures adopted there included the introduction of cooperative farms, the forced movement of some of the population, the repression of Buddhism, the formation of youth groups whose members were taken from their families, the extirpation of folk, folk culture, and the imposition of dress codes whereby everyone had to wear peasant work clothes in brackets, black cotton pajamas all the time. As a result of the harshness with which these policies were applied, more than 20,000 Cambodians sought asylum in South Vietnam. These policies probably flowed from decisions taken at Salat Sar in 1971 study session. They certainly had his approval and were introduced nationally after April 1975 with more radical proposals such as the abolition of money, markets and schools and the evacuation of entire towns and cities. Before I ask you uh, some questions, I'll indicate um, that in the tragedy of Cambodian history, the relevant passage is at English ERN 00193309-10, where you uh, date these developments to uh, May 1973. Um, could you describe for the court how it was that these developments um, uh, came into being, how they were promulgated, um, and, and what evidence is available of their implementation in practice through your research? Well, actually, uh, the uh, implementation of these policies in the Southwest was not uh, due to any of direct research of my own, but due to the uh, extraordinarily insightful long airgram sent by a young American Foreign Service officer stationed in uh, South Vietnam, who later became the American ambassador to Cambodia, Kenneth Quinn. He, uh, was working in Chao Doc on the border, uh, with, uh, very close to the border with Cambodia. He saw columns of smoke out of his, from his, from his house uh, across the border. And soon after that, refugees were coming into uh, Vietnam to say the kinds of things that were happening inside that area. The Southwest, of course, uh, throughout the history of, uh, of uh, 
ever since the CPK managed to take control of that area, became a very severe and very loyal uh, portion of the communist regime. This is the Tamok area of Takeo, particularly of Takeo province. And Tamok was uh, pretty much in command of these uh, reforms working within the framework, as he understood it, uh, as a member of the Central Committee himself, of the uh, policies uh, of uh, the policies of the, uh, of the party. Now, this shows, it seems to me, that the significance is that the, when they were able to do it, the Khmer Rouge were happy to, well, if happy is the right word, were eager to uh, uh, put these policies in place, not to test them to see if they'd succeed, but just to put them in place full stop, because uh, their failure was uh, unthinkable. Uh, with, uh, failure of uh, policies was always the work of traitors anyway. So, was, so it wasn't really a test case, but it was for the outside world, of course, who didn't have access to Quinn's uh, uh, telegrams, we didn't know about it, uh, a prelude to the kinds of behavior that was going to happen later. And that's what makes that uh, evidence uh, really quite significant. You, um, in that passage of that I read, you, you draw a, um, uh, if you like, a, a um, well, you state that the, the policies were um, then introduced after April 75, that is, the connection before, um, In your study of CPK uh, publications and uh, other have you uh, found evidence or, 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 um, speeches or information that would support the continuity of that, of that policy, the, the, its, if you like, uh, initiation in, in around 1970, and then its continued existence, uh, as you indicated through April 1975 and the brief answer there has to be no, because I don't, I don't recall uh, statements by the CPK later on of praising uh, these activities in 73. I think such documents may well exist in, in uh, revolutionary fag articles, but I can't cite them at this moment. They were certainly, I, they were certainly not unhappy with this. These procedures, Tamok was never uh, uh, disciplined at all for supervising these severe policies. Can you tell us if you, if you recall, perhaps more generally, um, whether the, these policies, alleged policies of uh, forced collectivization and forced movement um, were discussed in the revolutionary flag from 1975 I'd have to check. I, 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 I might be able to find that material for you. I might not, but it would seem to me, I vaguely, vaguely remember seeing something like this, but I can't cite it, and I'd have to, I have to verify. I might come back with an answer tomorrow, but I'm not sure that it'll be a very helpful one. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We might, we might encounter some of those documents as we go forward, see if you're able to assist us with them. Another... Um, set of events that you uh, deal with in relation to the pre-1975 period um, is the, uh, the emptying of urban areas, and you, you uh, delve into this in a bit more detail um, in other passages that uh, we'll look at. In Brother Number One, the command ERN is 00821765. And perhaps if we could show that command page on the screen, the English ERN is 00393014. Mr. President, with your permission, we'll show that uh, command page on the screen. And I will. Thank you. Thank you. If the AV unit could assist us, I'll. I'll uh, and I apologize if it, it is not particularly clear. Um, we're looking at an entire page. Um, the quote is as follows, and it, re it relates to an assault on Kampong, town of Kampong Cham. The assault on Kampong Cham was probably intended to sustain momentum. Vietnamese forces nearby did nothing to help. 
Vietnam được bán ở một bàn chuối tiền ở đầm nạc cao mới còn có công nghệ tiền của bàn chuối khai chia bảy buồn rời 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 bàn chuối And other Republican towns and cities. Now, because it relates, I will also um, read a separate uh, a passage from the tragedy of Cambodian history, and this is at English ERN 0019331413. Should be page 231 if that makes it easier, Professor. Um, here you're dealing with um, an attack uh, a few months after the Kampong Cham uh, incident. This is now in March 74. Uh, and you, and you, it's in relation to the uh, royal ca former royal capital of Udong. You say, when their troops overran the former royal capital of Udong, north of Phnom Penh, in March 1974, some 20,000 people were let off into the countryside, where the class enemies among them were executed, and the others put to work. Professor, what is the significance, if any, of these events for uh, what happened in April 1975 uh, when the Khmer Rouge toppled the Khmer Rouge regime. Well, I think uh, for an historian, uh, the significance of these uh, evacuations was to show uh, very unlike the first impressions people got, including myself, in 1975, that the evacuation of the cities was un unprecedented and so on. Uh, in 1975, uh, it seemed to us, uh, I mean, observers of uh, Cambodia, that this was an unprecedented move. We now find from things that came to light after 1975, documents and so on, that this had been uh, predicted, if you like, in uh, both in, uh, in Takeo and in uh, Udong, and also in the town of Krache, which was also evacuated by when the Khmer uh, took it over, and Stung Treng to the further north. So it was a, it was a rep repetitive pattern that uh, then reached its, if you like, its, its uh, climax in the evacuation of Phnom Penh. Uh, the evacuation of Battambang was, of course, just as severe, but it doesn't get into the public record quite as much. So, yeah, it was a, it was a consistent pattern. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, um, I want to spend one more uh, uh, minute or two on this issue because um, it is dealt with in um, the revolutionary flag uh, an issue that, that you have looked at in your books, cited in your notes to your books. This is the special issue uh, for December 1976 and January 1977. Uh, the document number is E3-25. Um, the relevant ERN in Khmer is 00063039 to 40. In French, 00504049 to 50. And in English, 00491425. Given that we have the Khmer version of this, um, we will place that on the screen. Um, professor, we have a hard copy, which I'll ask my, my assistants to, to pass to you. This is the revolutionary flag issue for December 1976 and 19, January 1977. Um, now, given that the Khmer text will be on the screen, I will uh, read some passages in English for everyone's benefit, for those who don't read Khmer. Um, and it relates to uh, some of these um, events. At point A on that page, attacking the enemy politically, taking just one example, fighting to seize the people, 
Throughout the world, they never fought to seize the people. Our line was to fight to seize the people. One, we took him. Two, we took them. One hundred, we took them. One thousand, we took them. And so on until we fought for and seized the people from Phnom Penh too. The line of drying up the people from the enemy was very correct. Now, then further down, um, the, the authors of this publication give uh, three examples, which um, uh, or rather two examples, one of which we've considered. The first example is the fighting in Banam in 1973. The publication says, we took everyone in Banam town, expelling the ethnic Vietnamese, the ethnic Chinese, the military, the police. We took everyone, drying up the people from the enemy. And then, finally, uh, Again, in, on the, in the same document, uh, continuing further down, an example that deals with Udong, which we just discussed, quote, we liberated Udong in 1974. We pulled out all the people. When they took it back, they had no forces. What I'm interested in in these, in these quotes, Professor Chandler, is the use of the phrase seizing the people. Um, are you able to elaborate on what the party means by uh, seizing the people, removing them from areas which, uh, which, uh, which are overrun by the I think it's, it's pretty clear as a, as a policy, as I mentioned in the other uh, page, it was a pre, uh, even pre-colonial policy of, say, the Thai, Thai army when they invaded Cambodia in 1833, they did the same thing, they cleaned out Phnom Penh. They didn't, they didn't bring the Phnom Penh population into the Thai army, they just drove them out to, to clear the place out so there'd be nothing to support any kind of military action in, in response. I think this is the idea. They didn't know exactly who all these people were in terms of, um, of class or loyalty. Pretty sure they weren't very loyal or they'd be in the, in the uh, Maquis supporting the revolution. So they were sort of intrinsically dis disloyal and had to be pulled away from these places where if they were left behind, in their view, and I think were fairly correct from a military point of view, would form the basis for another set of angry anti-Khmer Rouge people. Thank you. Um, I want to deal next with um, another uh, uh, policy we, we touched earlier on the, uh, the, the fate of uh, the cadre returning from Hanoi. Um, uh, and I'd like to consider uh, briefly um, a policy which you uh, discuss um, in Voices of S21. Now, we have this also in, in Khmer. Um, the document number is D108-50-1.4-1. Um, I think we have an objection. Thank you, Mr. I, I apologize for interrupting, but I believe uh, the expert uh, corrected the, the prosecutor once before that uh, those coming from Vietnam were not Vietnam, but not Vietnam. So if we could uh, perhaps reformulate the question to come forward, some accuracy. The correction by the professor was that there were not CPK cadre. Um, I, I use the word cadre um, in a more general sense now, but um, perhaps the professor uh, can correct me when, when we ask him to answer the question. If it's appropriate the professor. Yeah, thank you. We'll, we'll proceed. Um, so we were looking at Voices from S21. Uh, this is in Chapter 2. Uh, it is at pages 21 and 22. The relevant Khmer ERN is 00191853-2. 
B English ERN 001927001 in French ERN 00357284 to 5 um, you're discussing here uh, just interested in, in obtaining a brief comment from you, if, if possible, is the activities uh, that, you, that you describe in, in, um, in terms of the setting up of security centers uh, in, in that period. Now, What you say, I'll read a brief passage, and what you say is the following, if we could have the Khmer on the screen for the benefit of Khmer readers. Dutch picked up his expertise in security matters as he went along. There is no evidence that he ever traveled abroad or received any training from foreign experts. He may well have developed his elaborate notions of treachery involving, quote, strings of traders between 1972 and 1973, when a secret operation was set up by the Khmer Rouge to purge the so-called Hanoi Khmer-Cambodians, who had come south in 1970 after years of self-imposed exile in North Vietnam, ostensibly to help the revolution. And then a little bit uh, further down, you state, uh, you, in, in relation to that campaign that you describe of the uh, arrests and uh, killings of uh, Hanoi people, or people that had returned from Hanoi, quote, the campaign indeed foreshadows, foreshadowed the modus operandi of S21. Now, I, I don't want you to um, expand on, on what appears to be uh, speculation on, on how Dutch might have developed his elaborate notions of treachery. You indicated you didn't interview uh, Dutch. So what I'm really interested in primarily is the, your comment that that campaign indeed foreshadowed the modus operandi of S21. If you could please expand on that conclusion. Certainly, uh, first of all, to get back to the question raised by the uh, Defense Council, uh, the word cadre might be been used a bit loosely, but uh, these were certainly not members of the CPK. That's the point I was trying to make. But a point about these people, and I've talked to a couple of them in the 90s who managed to survive, get out, come back to Cambodia. Uh, these were highly trained political animals. They've been in Vietnam for 15 years. And and the Vietnamese do not let up on political training for people who are under their advice. These people had probably more political training than anybody in the CPK. They were better trained communist cadre, in quotes, than the people who were uh, upset by them. And I think that may be a reason why some of the Khmer were upset by them. They didn't want to be upstaged by people they primarily assumed were foreign agents. Secondarily, they might have seen that were uh, better equipped to dialectic and things like that. That's just a preface to the answer. The uh, rest of your question, uh, or really your original question, uh, I think the idea of going after strings or ksai uh, is first evidence here. Um, and th that's the preface. That's all I meant, is that the, the, a string of traders, people with the same association, people who come from the same, later on the same workplace, belong to the same military division, uh, are related to uh, uh, some alleged defender, and so on. Uh, these people were a definable group, uh, and as I said before, happily for them, uh, some of them, uh, particularly the ones in the eastern part of the country, managed to scurry out of the country, you can say, I just assume that. Uh, the ones who stayed behind were, I think, taken by surprise and executed. There was no, there's no evidence of, we have nothing about education sites and so on. These people did not resurface in Cambodia. 
Gambia to the team. And just uh, on on that last comment, um, based on your research and study of of, of this period, um, is, is it possible that these people were not hurt, but rather had simply relocated elsewhere? Is there evidence of what may have happened to them other than uh, that they were targeted in these uh, purges? No, I think not. Uh, I was just uh, remembering uh, from the late 90s, I interviewed uh, one of these people here in Phnom Penh. And as I was <laughs> talking to him in Khmer, because he was taking notes of our interview in Vietnamese, this was the language in which he'd become more fluent over all those years. Uh, so it's a matter of, he was one of the people who, who uh, came down and went back, got out at, in, in 73, 4, or maybe I forget, might have been stayed behind. Not all the evacuees came down. But almost all of them did. So uh, what happened to them specifically, we don't have first confessions, documents of that sort. Uh, there, as is mentioned in uh, documents, and uh, uh, Deutsch has mentioned it, that this was a group of people who were done away with uh, out of suspicion of their motives. And loyalties, their loyalties, not their motives. Thank you. Um, were, were they uh, Cambodians or Vietnamese people? Oh, they were entirely uh, Cambodian. Uh, but as the terminology of the Khmer Rouge later on, they would have said there were people with Cambodian mind, bodies and Vietnamese heads. They'd been, the, Cambodian, the CPK thought these people had been turned and become Vietnamese. And this is a suspicion that these people were unable to allay after 15 years of residence in Hanoi. It was hard to say, no, no, I'm really totally Khmer. Was there, there were people who were suspected of being un-Cambodian because they'd been up there so long. Thank you, Professor. Um, and, and, and thank you for staying with me as we jump through a, a vast subject matter in a long uh, uh, period of time. Um, I, I will next turn to uh, the um, events which took place uh, on the 17th of April, 75, and following. Um, and as a prelude to that, um, I wish to discuss a decision which you deal with um, and which, uh, according to your uh, books was made in 1974 and which relates to the evacuation uh, of the cities. Um, now, here I am looking at, um, and I will ask my assistants again to pass to you the relevant, um, uh, the relevant book. We're looking at uh, your book, A History of Cambodia, which I don't think we have, you have a copy of just yet, so we can pass that on to uh, Professor Chandler. Um, the document number is D366-7.1.69, the ERNs in Khmer, 0067971271272, in English, ERN 0042238 Now, the passage uh, that I wish to refer you to, Professor Richard <coughs> It starts, or I'll, I'll, I will read it, two or three passages, but the first passage is, in the week after April 19, 17, 1975, over two million Cambodians were pushed into the countryside toward an uncertain face. And if we could have that Khmer page on the screen for the public, it would be grateful. A little bit further down, you say, Quote, the evacuation shocked its victims, as well as observers in other countries, who had hoped that the new regime would try to govern through reconciliation. These men and women may have forgotten the ferocity with which the civil war had been fought by both sides. Still other observers, more sympathetic to the idea of revolution, 
saw the evacuation of the cities as the only way in which Cambodia could grow enough food to survive, break down entrenched social hierarchies and set its utopian strategies in motion. The next passage deals with the, the time of the making of this decision. Quote, the decision to evacuate the cities was made by the CPK's leaders shortly before the liberation of Phnom Penh, but it was a closely kept secret and took even some communist commanders by surprise. One reason for the decision was that the capital was genuinely short of food. Another was the difficulty of administering several million people who had in effect opposed the revolution. A third was that the CPK leaders were fearful for their own security. Perhaps the overriding reason, however, was the desire to assert the victory of the CPK, the dominance of the countryside over the cities, and the privileged position of the poor. Salat Saar and his colleagues had not spent seven years in the forest and five years fighting a civil war to take office as city councillors. They saw the cities as breeding grounds for counter-revolution and their economic priorities were based on the transformation of Cambodian agriculture, especially on increasing the national production of rice. Professor, you uh, deal with the decision uh, in 1974, if we can take things in a chronological order, um, would you be able to expand on us on uh, your research into um, who that decision was made by and uh, perhaps when more specifically, if you recall. Could I have the page number, please? I'm, I'm, I've lost you a bit. Of course. Um, so if you're looking at the history of Cambodia, yeah. um, it, it should be on pages 210 and 211 if you're looking at the actual page numbers. That might be easiest. Um, and so just wait for the microphone. I don't see where I said 1974. I think this decision was made in February 1975, but I didn't say it in this passage. I said shortly before. I don't know. I, I'd rather not come down and say I said 74, because I don't think I ever did. And the evidence from other sources is that the decision was made in February 75, just to do it. But, so I, I just um, need to correct you, but just make sure that I'm not down to saying this decision was made in 74, because I don't think I ever wrote that. Um, I, may, I may stand corrected. If I wrote it somewhere, it's wrong, because February 75 is the right date. Shortly before is what I wrote here. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for your, for your uh, intervention there. The 1974, I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is draw together a number of your, of your uh, writings and, and in the interest of time. But um, I'm grateful that you're correcting us, because I wanna, I'll, I'll take you to the passage um, where um, that period appears to be relevant. Um, but in the meanwhile, we seem to have an objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I was uh, listening quite well to uh, attentively to what was being read, and I was shocked uh, that uh, the prosecutor injected 1974, uh, and I was waiting to hear what the professor would say. Now it seems that what the prosecution is intending to do is read and then incorporate from elsewhere uh, into his question. Uh, this puts us at a disadvantage. I understand that they have some problems with time, uh, but we need to go step by step. So if they're going to be referring to a particular document, read that document. I would respectfully request that the prosecutor be instructed to simply ask a question based on the document that's being shown, not some other document that perhaps they're trying to correlate the information into the question. Thank you. Mr. President, um, I'm certainly not trying to mislead the professor. My, my um, use of that year is based on, on uh, in fact, his other book. Um, and perhaps uh, to uh, avoid any confusion, 
I can read that other passage, um, and clearly the professor is, uh, is um, able to opine. He has already indicated that he, he thought 1974 may not be the right, the right time. So with your leave, I would simply read uh, another passage from another book where uh, that year comes up. អរគុណមេអនុញ្ញាតហើយសូមរំលឹកជាបន្ថែមទៀតដល់អ្នកជំនាញសូមសម្រួលនៅការឆ្លើយ <coughs> <coughs> Thank you, Council. That was going to be my next um, point. Um, the, the book that um, I was referring to is Brother Number One. We've already looked at it a number of times. Um, it is E3 slash 17. The passage which deals with the decision to evacuate the cities and um, which discusses events in 1974 is at Khmer ERN 00821 English ERN 003930163. That should be at page 102 of the English version, Professor, if you have it. It's, uh, it's brother number one. I think you, you may be holding a different book, or you've been able to find it. Thank you. Um, and. The, the, the page, um, if, if we are able to show the Khmer version on the screen, I'd be grateful. Um, this is what is said on that page. Toward the end of 1974, Chu Chet, the Secretary of the Southwestern Zone, met South South in rural Kampong Chna, where he was coordinating plans for the, storming, for the third storming attack in 1975. Pol Pot declared in 1977 that the Central Committee had decided on this final assault at a meeting in June 1974. And if we move two paragraphs down, the passage uh, that I wish to read is as follows. About this time, the Central Committee decided what actions the Communists would take following their victory. The most important of these was to evacuate Phnom Penh and all other towns controlled by the Republican regime, driving their populations, well over two million people, into the countryside where they would pose no threat to the party and, in theory, could engage in productive work. This dispersal of enemies was breathtaking in its simplicity. At this point, the Central Committee also decided to abolish money markets and private property throughout the country. The cadre were not informed of these decisions until the eve of the final assault. That's the passage, um, the entire page, if you like, from which um, I had inferred that uh, reference to about this time was to the 1974 uh, meetings, which were also discussed. Now, please ignore my interpretation um, and simply give us your recollection and your conclusions. Yeah, um, I don't say specifically that the Central Committee meeting was held in any time in 1974. Uh, I know in fact in February 1975 I probably should have said that in that book that I wrote 20 years ago, but I didn't. Uh, we know now that's when it was. When I said about that time, it may well have been that at the time I was writing the book, I, I didn't have a month and year. I had the decision, an undated decision made. Uh, you know, February 75 isn't far from December 74, so about that time. But I don't want, I, I'm agreeing here with the Defense Council, I don't want to give 
the idea that there was a 74 decision described in anything I've written, because I don't think there was one. I think the decision was early 75, and that's, I think that's part of the public record. There's other many sources. Tell, tell me about that. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm being told to slow down, and I, I do apologize to the interpreters and uh, those listening in Khmer and French. Now that we've dealt with the, uh, the timing uh, of the decision, um, I wish to come back to what you described as the overriding reason for the decision, uh, it being, quote, the desire to assert the victory of the CPK, the dominance of the countryside over the cities, and the privileged position of the poor. Could you explain what you meant in that passage? Yes, I certainly stand by that passage, although it contains an element of an assumption, because this was not ever given by uh, Khmer Rouge spokespeople later as the overriding reason when they were uh, approached by outsiders. Uh, uh, they often came up with other reasons, which I think were also valid. There's a bunch of reasons. I'm not saying that the shortage of food was bad or the fear of an American attack. Was There's lots of ones that were mentioned. There, but it seems to me the speed with which they went at this uh, evacuation, the uh, failure to ever uh, regret any aspects of the evacuation by any spokesman during the regime. Later on, you have people saying, oh, that was a terrible thing to happen. Nothing was, if it was said at the time, it was said in private. And this is one of the things that Kyusan Pan has said. So I, I objected, but it didn't get anywhere. But we, didn't, we never read about any kind of difference of opinion. So it struck me that, yeah, I mean, the people in the cities were by definition enemies of the people of the capital P, the people who were fighting to liberate Cambodia from feudalism and imperialism, uh, which were located in the eyes of the uh, leaders of the CPK and many ordinary Khmer too, I think, in the cities. The cities were where the bad things were happening. People were told, for example, that the American bombers were based in Phnom Penh. People didn't know about Guam and, and uh, Satahip in Thailand. Oh, they were coming out of Phnom Penh to bomb their own people in 73, they were told. So the anger, the level of anger, can't be exaggerated. Uh, the level of, of triumphal uh, feeling that they had, uh, in quotes, defeated the Americans is what they said they'd done. Uh, all these things combined to give me that set to have me produce a sentence that this was the overriding thing was uh, just the momentum of the victory included this eventually quite cruel uh, uh, procedure. But they didn't, they never looked back. I think this, the, the, the cities never became, oh gosh, we made a mistake. The cities really were a source of great <laughs> potential. They were a source of labor, is what they, and the, of labor for them, agricultural labor, not expertise, bourgeois activities, and so on. Thank you, Professor. Now, you indicated um, just then that um, these, these uh, urban people were seen as a source of, source of labor. Um, so I'd like to uh, move on to um, your treatment of um, the issue of urban people and how in your conclusions, they were classified and, and treated. The first passage that um, I wish to read is again from brother number one, E3 slash 17. This is at Khmer ERN 00821 And 
English ERN 00392915. It actually continues, I believe, from the previous passage that we looked at. And uh, this is only a brief um, section I wish to read. When they asked questions of the heavily armed young soldiers who accompanied them, they were told to obey the, quote, revolutionary organization, end quote, in brackets, Anka Padivat, which would act as their, quote, mother and father. The evacuees were called new people or April 17 people because they had joined the revolution so late. Residents of the countryside were known as base people and were treated less harshly than the others. Before I um, ask for your uh, explanation of these, of these passages, I want to also um, refer to another related um, passage. This is in the tragedy of Cambodian history uh, at page 242 of the original. And again, we only have an English version, so the English ERN is 00-19. 3325. And what you say there is the following. In 1975, the violence was widespread in Batambang, less frequent in other regions, and rare in the eastern part of the country. But everywhere, individual rights and preferences were subordinated to revolutionary duties and to the class interests of poor peasants as perceived by the organization. Before Anka's priorities became known, many, quote, April 17 people, end quote, were punished and executed for actions they considered harmless or beneficial, actions such as foraging for family members, concealing rations, telling the truth about their education, or complaining about work conditions. If we could start with the um, classification um, of people into new people and base people, uh, in your research, what did that classification uh, represent? What did it mean? I think uh, <coughs> quite easily it was a way of defining the Cambodian population in terms of us and, us and them, the winners and the losers, basically, the, uh, the revolutionaries and the people they defeated. Uh, all of these were synonyms. The language often in the Khmer period is seemingly kind of soft or, or, or enigmatic. Uh, so they don't use these ferocious terms, they just say April 17th or new, which are very bland terms, but I think everybody knew pretty fast that they weren't just new April 17th, they were targeted enemies of the, uh, they, they were able to be targeted if they made any missteps, they were being watched, they were not trusted. And Again, if we look at some of the um, punishments meted out, or perhaps more, more, more precisely reasons for punishment meted out to these people, as you uh, concluded, such as for foraging for family members and um, telling the truth about their education, etc. Um, does this emanate from any policy in particular or any direction that the party is taking? I can't trace it to a particular policy statement, but it seems to me that uh, the status of these people, uh, the, the way they were being observed, 
that everything flowed from that, that they were under suspicion, that they had to work very hard to get out from under that. There were some elements in this early period of uh, April 75 to early 76 that this is a process of re-education, of, of constructing new people, put it another way, constructing uh, Better, better people out of the new people to have them become true Cambodians by working hard and obeying the rules and so on. Uh, so I think it was that was the bland part of re-education. But from the tradition of the way the Khmer Rouge had acted toward their enemies throughout, and, and the way the Lon Nol people had acted toward their enemies, they were merciless with people who stepped out of line. They weren't saying, oh, you're just being re-educated, uh, don't do it again. Or they did that a couple of times. Every three times you offended was, was the last time uh, that you went away. So, yeah, it follows. Generally, nothing was that specifically said by the leaders that I know of. I mean, make sure that this, but it, it all made sense and none of it was withdrawn later as policy. Now, if, if we can expand on um, the classifications, and this will be my last question uh, before the break, uh, subject to the President's instructions. Uh, this is in voices from S21, D108, slash 50, slash 1.4.6, uh, Khmer ERN 0018251728, to eight. English ERN. I apologize. Yes, Mr. President. Um, Khmer ERN 0018251728. English ERN 0019815. And French ERN 0035739. Um, if we could uh, give the professor. Uh, this, this, this passage in hard copy, um, Professor, if it's easier for, to, for you to look at the hard copy, it's at page 122 um, in the original uh, publication. And you discuss here the, um, this, this, this uh, classification and, and, and the status that, um, that it carried with it um, for those affected. Quote, elsewhere in DK, most base people were given enhanced status. They were placed in the same categories as Communist Party members who had passed the Communist Youth League phase, either as candidates or as having full rights. In contrast, new people, as Cambodians with urban and non-revolutionary backgrounds were called, became known as Deposities, a category reflecting their status as people evacuated to the countryside. In so far as um, uh, we see, we see you, you're referring to, to, to a classification into three groups. Um, would you care to expand on um, the reasons for the creation of the positive uh, group and, and what it meant for those that were in the group? Again, I'm not sure <coughs> how widely known these classifications were among uh, newer base people, uh, how widely they were spread. I think uh, the purpose seems fairly obvious. It's to, again, separate uh, the clean uh, Cambodians from the dirty Cambodians, and the dirty ones are the ones who have been sent out, exile, Pinyao. You send a letter, it's the same verb. Uh, they do not have uh, status as candidates or so on. Not till 1978 did this uh, uh, categorization was withdrawn by the regime who said now you can, people who have once been in the cities can now aspire to candidate social status, not candidate status in the Communist Party. Again, it's a way of praising the people who stayed behind and, and, and setting aside the people who uh, were, were exiled from the cities. 
when I say state bond, the ones who were in the countryside at the point of liberation. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. President, I can continue at this point for, uh, if you wish to call a break, if you are disposed. មួយសាមសិបនាទីរសៀលនេះសូមបញ្ជើញចូលវិញមិនបន្តគេចំណើកការសម្មនាការហើយមន្ត្រីរដ្ឋបាលតុលាការផ្ដល់កន្លែងស